and welcome to the 14th meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. And as usual at this point, uh, I ask everyone present to switch off mobile phones as they can sometimes interfere with the sound system. Although I also draw people's attention to the fact that members and officials will be using um, uh, various devices, electronic devices, um, instead of the hard copies of their papers. Uh, our first and only item today um, is uh, the round ta table evidence session on the Care of Scotland Bill. This is our first evidence session at the committee, uh, 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 which begins today. Uh, we are a wee bit later this morning because we had a, a briefing from Scottish Government um, uh, officials on the bill prior to coming along. Uh, as as um, as as normal in a, a round table, um, we we introduce uh, ourselves. My name is Duncan McNeil, uh, MSP for Greenock and Inverclyde, convener of the Health and Sport Committee. Andrew. Uh, Andrew Strong, Policy and Information Manager at the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland. Bob Doris, MSP for Glasgow and Deputy Convener of the Committee. Fiona Colley, Policy and Public Affairs Manager from Care Scotland. Mike McKenzie, MSP Highlands and Islands Region. And good morning. Uh, I'm Dennis Robertson. I'm the MSP for Aberdeenshire West. My name's Heather Noller. I'm the Policy Officer for Carers Trust Scotland. Uh, good morning. I'm Colin Keir. I'm the MSP for Edinburgh Western. Claire Cairns, Network Coordinator for the Coalition of Carers in Scotland. Good morning, Richard Lyle, MSP for the Central Region. Uh, good morning. Uh, Scott Richardson Reid, Policy and Development Worker for the Scottish Transitions Forum, part of ARC Scotland. Lynette Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. Suzanne Munday, Chief Exec of MECOP. Rhoda Grant, Highlands and Islands, MSP. Uh, ben Hall, Communications Developer from Shared Care Scotland. Okay. Do you have a committee member to ask a question? Rhoda, thank you. And then Dennis, I see. Um, can I ask, is there some, uh, are there things that are missing from the bill that people would have liked to have seen in that? Um, there, there's probably a couple of things. I, I think probably one of our primary focuses has been around um, hospital discharge. Um, we know that this is a time that's very difficult for carers. Quite often it's the first time that they've become a carer. Um, but there's large proportions of carers from our service who say that they're not consulted or involved. And I think probably one of the, the main difficulties with that, not just about them not being consulted and involved, that about 20% say that the person has to be readmitted within one month. We think it's very important that carers have a choice about caring, but also that they're fully involved in decisions from admission to discharge and that social care services are in place and without involving carers fully that can't happen. Um, we did uh, research in uh, 2001 and the picture was exactly the same and there's so many discharge uh, policies and protocols in place but at the moment they don't appear to be working and that's why we would like to see a duty to involve and inform carers. Anyone else? You're making me blush now. <laughs> um, we would also like to see the inclusion of an equal opportunities clause on the face of the bill. And um, we feel this is necessary because there is a substantial body of evidence to show that very limited progress has been made in supporting carers with one or more protected characteristics. Now, normally this is seen in relation to black and minority ethnic carers, but we are talking the whole range of protected characteristics. So, for example, carers within the LGBT community, um, disabled carers, and that's a growing number from the, the evidence that we have. And we do feel the bill could be strengthened with this inclusion. Clear. We'd also like the bill to include um, a statement or a principle around carers as equal partners in care. 
Uh, the Community Care and Health Act 2002 recognises carers as key partners in providing care and this was strengthened in the carers strategy where carers were recognised as equal partners in care. It's something we had a consultation session um, with our members um, recently in March and it was something that came across very strongly with them. They would like to see carers as equal partners within the bill. Um, it's also something which a lot of people put in their submissions to the Health and Sport Committee. Um, both carers, local care organisations, but also local authorities recognised carers as equal partners within their submissions, um, including COSLA. Okay. Scott, did I see you indicating there? Oh, no. Like well, don't. You, you, it's like, like, make a bid here, that's you. You've got <laughs> Andrew? Yeah, um, in terms of the question, what is missing from this bill, uh, I, we at the Alliance think, um, and I know a number of our members think, that the bill could be strengthened with the inclusion of emergency planning on the face of it. Um, we think that a specific provision to be included in the content of the Adult Care Support Plan and in the uh, content of a Young uh, Care Statement would really make a difference. Um, probably like to take this opportunity to remind the committee that this issue was first raised in 2004 um, with a petition from the Murray Owen Carers Group um, on the impact of uh, caring for the growing number of older carers who were caring for people with long-term, uh, uh, people with learning disabilities specifically. Um, and some limited progress has been made across the country. Um, but to see that that um, provisions around about this have not been included in the bill surprised me. Um, the issue hasn't reduced since 2004. There's more um, older carers out there. 11% um, of over 65s across the country uh, are now carers, according to the late Scottish Government statistics. Over half of those provide 35 hours or more, or more a week in terms of care. Um, and while the Scottish Government has responded to those calls, it said that um, emergency planning is not for all carers. Um, uh, all carers won't require one, um, an, an emergency plan. I join Enable Scotland to a member of the Alliance in contending that all carers do require some discussion of what's going to happen in the future when they're no longer able to care. Um, if we haven't thought about what happens in an emergency, we run the risk of carers falling through the gaps um, and not having had that discussion at, at all. And many of these carers just want peace of mind about what will happen in the future. Um, we're aware of situations where... Um, uh, uh, someone with a learning disability, their, their care has no longer been able to care, their mother's maybe, maybe died, and they've been placed in an emergency respite, um, uh, in, in, in a, given an emergency respite place for a longer period of time than you would really expect. Um, and carers are worried that that's what's going to happen to their son or daughter uh, in the future, and, and we really need provision around about that in order to be um, more preventative to that kind of thing happening. Thanks, Andrew. Any, any other panel members wish to chip in at this point? Fiona? Um, I just want, uh, would like to add a, a couple of other things, and, and they're really about the bill being an opportunity to, to explore these issues. Um, I think the role of the wider NHS um, is possibly not, it, it is mentioned, but possibly not explored uh, as deeply as it could be. Um, the role of GPs will be absolutely critical. Um, they already have GP registers, which we think are very good. Um, but the question is what happens when someone's on a, a GP register? Um, there's an opportunity here to uh, formalise or make more clear what should happen. That could be referral to a local care support centre. It could be referral for an adult care support plan. It could be simple, something as simple as a trigger for an appointment to have a discussion about your caring role and what that means to your health and whether you need, for example, a health check. That might be around uh, what services the practice um, already offers. Um, I think there's also the issue of, of the NHS wider involvement in the development of carer strategies. Um, it's very clear that local authorities will have the duty to produce it, but we believe that these should be produced jointly, particularly um, in the light of integrated services, so that carers have a journey across both services and are very clear what they're entitled to expect. Um, we also highlighted, and, and a number of carers highlighted um, with us, the opportunity to look at a um, method of redress. Um, now, this has been something that has been on the table for quite a long time. I, I, I look back on it, too, and I think it's been since 2008, and it moved forward uh, to the review of social work complaints in 2011. 
um, and that recommended there would be a role for the, um, the Public Services Ombudsman um, in a, the, the final stage of, of social work complaints. Um, at the moment, when people have a complaint around social work services and go to the Ombudsman, it can only be on service failure or maladministration. Um, the recommendation was that the there was balance and it was the same as it was for the NHS where there was a, an opportunity for the SPSO to make um, decisions on professional judgment. Um, we think there's, that there's something missing here for carers to be able to have an opportunity to get redressed, get an answer to a problem um, without having to go to judicial review and involve solicitors and legal advice and all the, the not only the cost of that, but the, the very significant stress. Um, and we think we think there's possibly an opportunity to, for the committee to explore this further and to actually find out where, where this is at just now and how this can link in, not only with the Carers' Bill, but um, obviously with the wider integration agenda. Scott, and then Claire. I'm not scratching my eye this time. Um, <laughs> Made I, it clear that. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would second the fact around about accountability within the Carers' Bill and where does accountability sit. Um, looking at the issue of transitions for uh, young carers especially, the bill seems to be a little bit vague how it kind of meshes with the Children and Young People's Act um, and Child's Plan, risk to wellbeing and how this also meshes with the coordinated support plan with the additional support for learning. Um, it very much looks as though in the legislation that the young carers support plan will be something that's supplemental to already existing quite robust planning exercises and it would be good to see that as um, under the duties of the Children and Young Peoples Act which is one child one plan to kind of prevent duplication um, across and for accountability to be in place if these uh, carers plans from young carers to adult carers or um, carers' plans aren't actually kind of followed through. Is the accountability with the local authority, or is it with, as my colleague said, something bigger than that? Is it with the, like the ombudsman or something larger? Clear. Thank you. Uh, we welcome the duty on local authorities to develop a local carers' strategy. We'd like to see, in addition to that, that they should have a financial breakdown of the resources they're going to direct to carer support. Um, the financial memorandum it's, itself says that um, there isn't adequate data at the moment in terms of what resources are directed towards carer support locally. And so we think that needs to be part of local care strategy, but also part of joint strategic commissioning plans locally. And one of the particular reasons for this is new resources will be directed towards care support through the bill for the new duties. And we need to make sure that these are in addition to current resources directed to local care support. I think the best way of doing that is through those two mechanisms. Well, Ben. What Claire just spoke about in the care strategy. Um, I think that there is a, um, a missed opportunity to require local authorities to plan for the provision of short breaks um, uh, to allow for sort of carers to have choice and flexibility uh, about the services that they access locally. And I think if there was a requirement within the carer's strategy that um, local authorities did that, then that would be a, uh, a strengthening of the bill for care, from a carer's perspective. Okay. Well, that was, that was a quick run through and I, and I think it was, it, was, it was a pretty good summary actually of the submissions that that, that have come in and uh, you know I, I, I suppose maybe we should attempt to get behind some of the issues I mean I've, we've got the, the, the you know the that single journey between the community and the and the hospital and back and forth and the hospital discharge we've got equality we've got emergency planning um, the you know the, the financial resources to be identified that, that's going to improve it from, from carers, the short breaks, um, and um, the legislative landscape and the clarity that needs to uh, exist there. So there's a, a, a number uh, of of issues there. I don't know whether we can, uh, in, uh, in the next hour or so, usefully explore some of some of these just to add to the evidence. Would, would any anyone want it? Take this a wee bit further, or do, would it be a helpful direct question from a committee member in some of these areas? Sir? Yes, Scott. I'll take it forward for now and then pass out to colleagues. Yeah. Just, just from a transitions point of view, um, we have carers that have come to us, and, and the stories are really, really unpleasant. Um, 
when a young person who they're caring for leaves school, um, they don't meet the eligibility criteria for health and social care services in Scotland, um, which means that the person that was caring for them that used to be in full-time employment has since had to quit their job. Um, and it means that they might uh, end up divorced from their husband. I'm painting a very bleak picture, um, but these are stories that we hear. Um, and eventually they have been known to put themselves at risk to get the services to support them and their young person because of the eligibility criteria is such a big issue for um, carers and not having access to mm. services. Mm. So I, I guess in terms of transitions for, for an adult carer, that, that is one area of concern. Um, and then if we look at the area for transitions of young carers becoming adult carers, again, they have to go through a whole reassessment process. And what we're hoping with this bill is that it will come with some financial uh, input into local authorities. But the question remains for our members that uh, is the carer's assessment unlocking funds to the carer? Or is the carer's assessments only unlocking the ability for carers to access respite? Or is there other services that the carer's assessment will be unlocking in local authorities? And we have to bear this in mind within a self-directed support budget. Um, will it all be in one pot? Will a carer have a pot of money of their own to provide services for themselves to continue supporting? Um, and how all this kind of mixed together within the kind of Children and Young Peoples Act and all the other legislation, it looks like quite a kind of bleak picture at the moment. I suppose the, the, the question is then what gives you hope that there will be sufficient and additional funds that, we, that would lead you to believe that we'll be able to eat, meet the additional demand that would arise out of, of this legislation and give you those individual pots of money. Does anyone want to pick up on that? Some figures. Yeah. Um, there was £176 average cost per carer's assessment per person. Someone can correct me if I get these wrong. Um, and there's looking to be around about £88.5 million put into the local authorities, I think, at stage two, which is roughly doing very fast maths, and I'm not an expert at maths, £2.5 million per local authority to provide these services. But it's our kind of wondering, will this be fed into a self-directed support setup budget or will it be sitting separately uh, for the carer to get support to continue caring and how will this look in terms of the legislation rollout? Will it be joined together or will it be separate monies? Sorry. Claire? Um, I'd love to say I'm about to answer this question, but probably what I'm going to do is ask some more questions. That, 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 um, well, this is the opportunity to do that and we'll ask questions on your behalf from the... Yes. Governor and its ministers, yeah. Thank you. I mean, as the national care organisations, we have also put in a submission to the Finance Committee. And obviously, we've looked through the financial memorandum in doing that and how costs have been estimated and um, sort of how many, what the demand is, is likely to be in terms of care support. Um, so we've got a few questions around resources that go to the bill. And obviously, it's incredibly important that the bill does have adequate resources um, because otherwise... And um, what will happen is it'll be very difficult for local authorities to implement the duties and it may result then in cuts to other services as well. So we want to avoid that happening because any cuts to service users will automatically impact on carers as well because it's a family unit. Um, but some of the questions we have around um, the financial memorandum is firstly, um, there's quite a few funding streams which are coming to an end when it comes to carers. Um, so, for example, the respite funding of £2.28 million is coming to an end. Um, we had, through the change fund, 20% of resources were directed to care support. The same thing hasn't happened through the integrated care fund, so there is insecurity around that funding. And the care information strategy funding of £5 million is coming to an end. Now, there are resources, for example, in the um, financial memorandum directed to um, the NHS, so that may cover the, the loss of the £5 million. But I suppose our question is, if the financial memorandum is costing the additional duties of the bill and we're already losing funding from other streams, will it be adequate? Because you need to take that figure away. You need to take away that deficit. Um, we also have a question around preventative support. Um, so the bill, the financial memorandum costs additional duties, but what will be very important in um, providing a framework for care support is that early preventative support very often provided through the third sector. Um, now, it's really important that that funding continues because apart from anything else, the demand will increase 
when you're providing information and advice in a universal way and you're also providing adult care support plans universally, naturally those carers who don't meet eligibility criteria will still need some form of service and that will be likely to be preventative support provided through the third <coughs> sector. So that needs to be considered as well and no money is going towards care support in the third sector um, as indicated through the financial memorandum so we're a bit concerned about that. Um, and um, another one for example would be costings in the financial memorandum for example there are new posts costed um, in order to um, look at the duty around information and advice but there are already posts for example in the third sector providing that service what we need to make sure is these will be additional posts to cope with <coughs> the increasing demand rather than simply um, replacing the funding that exists already so it's apologies for not providing solutions it's more questions no, on that, it. That, 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 that's useful to, yeah, to provide that context. No money else on, on that one. I mean, Dennis, are you going to, yeah. going to come in on something else? And then I've got Mike, I think, that wants to come in. Bob, as well. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I wonder if um, I may explore uh, a bit with you the eligibility criteria, because from some of the evidence we've actually received already, it seems a sort of very polarised issue. Uh, to some extent, uh, some people preferring the uh, sort of national approach to setting the criteria, and others preferring a local, uh, a more local approach to setting the criteria. Uh, I believe that the majority of you here uh, today are uh, supporters or in support of the national framework in terms of the eligibility criteria. Um, if that's the case, why why do you prefer the national over local, and do we have enough there? Uh, and picking up Scott's point earlier, in terms of that transition, um, to ensure that, especially from young people going into adult care situations, that the, the eligibility criteria would meet that. So I'd like your views as to why you think the national criteria is a better pathway than the local one. Or perhaps, uh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe some of you do prefer the local one. Scott, and then Claire. Um, I'll, I'll get the ball rolling. Um, <laughs> our members find that th their favourite phrase when referring to eligibility criteria is postcode lottery. Um, <laughs> that every different local authority has a very different approach to funding services, and this should be based on a, a, a needs-based measurement within the local authority, and local authorities should also potentially be capturing unmet need. Um, what we're finding is, um, and following the work of people like Colin Salzberg and Kirsten Stalker and the Children's Commissioner, um, is that eligibility criteria uh, across the whole of Scotland might be set at critical or substantial, but what services are provided under the moniker of critical and substantial vary very differently across the whole of Scotland. Some people offer quite a wide collection of services under substantial eligibility criteria. Other people might just offer one and two. Uh, other local authority areas, depending on rurality and things, might not be able to offer very much at all. But what we have is um, a very mixed Scotland-wide picture on eligibility criteria. And for people who might have out-of-authority placements, um, coming from uh, a school where they have been uh, looked after, and moving back into a local authority, that can cause a lot of issue for people. Um, in regards to the eligibility criteria in a national model, it would be helpful, but uh, there is also the problem within the eligibility criteria that means that that doesn't allow for preventative work to be happening in health and social care. Um, and if you look at the work of Sir Harry Burns and the Chief Medical Officer um, in England, they are very much proponents of a preventative model of uh, health and social care and if we're setting eligibility criteria around risk prevention rather than preventative work it's it's meaning that we can't support people who might need a little bit of support to stop them going into crisis what we're actually doing is waiting for these people to go into crisis and then we're getting people who are then accommodated or um, taken away from parents because they can't manage the support anymore um, so that's my two pence is why it would be a useful Thanks, model. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. Um, 
carers came out very strongly that they wanted national eligibility criteria. Um, when they were doing um, consultation around proposals for the bill, we consulted with over 500 carers around Scotland, and 95%, over 95% actually said that they supported national eligibility criteria. And the reasons for wanting it is very much alongside what Scott was saying. They wanted an end to the postcode lottery. I think for most carers, what the bill is about is having rights and entitlements to support for the first time. It's about having an assessment and then knowing that you will be able to get the services you're assessed as, needed, as you're needed, providing you meet eligibility criteria, which is why the eligibility criteria is so important. And what they have said very much is they want to know what they're entitled to, they want to know what their rights are. And the trouble is, if you have local eligibility criteria, there will be variation across 32 local authorities, there will be 32 different systems. It will be very difficult for carers to know what they're entitled to. It will also be prone to more variation, I think. So, for example, if local authorities are allowed to vary eligibility criteria, it means when carers finally get to a point where they get the support they need, and a lot of them say they have to battle for it, it means that they won't be secure in that support because it could change in a year or two's time. So I think setting national eligibility criteria means that you're um, ensuring carers know what they're entitled to and what level of support they're entitled to. Um, in addition, um, if you look at other countries, so for example, England and Wales have both introduced national eligibility criteria. And if you look across Europe as well, there are many examples of countries where they have national eligibility to social care support. In fact, there are no examples we found where they have local eligibility. So I mean, examples show that it's the best way to provide equity for people and transparency and ensure that people know what they're entitled to. And certainly as well in terms of the submissions, having read through them, what's interesting to know is of the 69 submissions, only five were coming out in support of local eligibility criteria. The rest were in favour of um, where they stated their preference, were in favour of national. And that would include all the submissions from uh, local and national care organisations, carers themselves, but also from a few interesting places from um, a couple of local authorities were also in support of national eligibility criteria, Eastern Bartonshire Council, South Lanarkshire Council as well. And the Scottish Human Rights Commission and Equality and Human Rights Commission both said they were in support of national eligibility criteria because otherwise you would have a lack of equity um, across Scotland. Right, anyone else on that one? Andrew? I'll let the panelists in. Just going on from what Claire was saying at the end there about the um, Scottish Human Rights Commission, their concern is about portability of care. So if you live in one local authority and you receive services, yeah. you're then not able to move into another local authority where you won't receive services. So we're, we're in agreement with the need for national eligibility criteria. Um, the postcode lottery situation is already happening in some cases around about health and social care. Talk about um, charging for non-residential um, uh, social care where there's 32 different systems all charging different amounts for different types of care and if you live on one street and you're in one local authority you'll be ch paying more than someone who's on the next street in another local authority and it creates a divide between people and I think this that issue is currently being progressed through the petitions committee we would like to see this bill go down a different track altogether Fiona very brief point is to say that what we're not really we're not talking about cutting across local accountability and local discretion to develop services in different ways because each area will be different services in Glasgow will be different to services in a rural area what we're talking about primarily in the first instance is looking at where thresholds are set and that carers are very clear if I meet this threshold I will receive support and it may be different in different areas, but you've got a bit of an idea that I'm going to get something. I wonder if we have been to blow that a wee bit. Yeah, you can, you can but I'm going to take the panellists yeah. always at uh, these, uh, these things. Uh, no, um, um, Dennis, and I've had a bid for um, from uh, Mike. I don't know if it's on this subject. Exactly. Right. The same territory, and I think De and, uh, Dennis has covered it very well, could be now. And so I'm happy to withdraw yeah, Mike, 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 my I'm question gonna, in yeah, favour of and, Dennis. And I've, I'm, just explaining for, I'm just explaining for Dennis's, Dennis's benefit that I see the different bids, and I'm just communicating yeah. to Dennis yeah. that there are on a, other bids. So first of all, I'm going to take the panellists, uh, Ben, I think. Uh, thank you very much, and it's a very quick point. 
I just thought it might be useful if I could just give a, give a very uh, concrete example about uh, the differences in short breaks that are provided around the country. And it's a very simple example that some local authorities provide um, holiday play schemes for families with disabled children, and some families don't. And so that means that some families struggle throughout the holiday period, uh, both in, and it has impacts on their health and well-being, and on their sort of employment possibilities. And I thought if I, an, an equity across the country uh, would be uh, a, des a desirable thing. Yes, Can, I'm going to convene my own, my, 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 my own judgments here, but is there not a cautionary tale in this? Because the expectation, if you've got a national, then everybody applies that high standard. But if you're working out a national standard, then it's more likely to be the middle road in terms of negotiation. You know, so there are... T I, I'm just wondering whether there's just a note of caution here about applying a national standard and an aspiration. And you can apply a national standard. It doesn't equal, you know, uh, an, uh, an eligibility assessment could become the standard could become 12 weeks. And there are people doing better than that now. And there, you know, and or, or children uh, are the example that you've just, you just mentioned. So two different things. Am I right or am I wrong? And my thought there. Right, there we go. I've, got, I've got a response. <laughs> so I've got Claire, I've got Suzanne, uh, uh, and, and Ben, and I think Scott wants back in, and everybody wants back in. <laughs> Claire? Oh, sorry, I wasn't, wasn't realising this first. Um, yes, just to sort of follow up from that point, um, what we would see the um, national criteria being would be a minimum standard. Local authorities would still have the power to provide carers over and above that service. Um, so, because the, the bill provides both the power and the duty to support carers, but what we believe um, needs to happen is, um, in some areas, um, carers are not being provided with the same level of service, so we need to bring them up to a minimum standard, but like I say, in other areas, um, they may decide to continue at the level they're at, which is possibly higher, and we've discussed this a lot with carers, and we've said, you do realise that if it is an eligibility criteria, then there is the possibility that your support could go up as well as down. And across the piece, they say, well, do you know, we want it to be fair and we understand that's the position. What we want to know as carers is what we are entitled to. I don't know whether that's an answer, but it doesn't answer the, po the, the postcode lottery, I don't think, Claire, in terms of the big objection. If people can apply a minimum standard, but some local authorities given their particular circumstances, could do better. That's a postcode lottery. Though, which I think is the... Yeah. We're only exploring... No, thing, we're yeah. just exploring the idea. Mm -hmm. You said that's what was important to, uh, to, uh, to... And, you know, I think some strong points in terms of people moving from one area to another area could still find themselves in a situation, given your scenario, that the, 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 their package could be different. Scott? Um, I was just going to add, if we think about eligibility criteria rather than what services are provided, rather than access to services, because they're gatekeeping tools, really, eligibility criteria, you have to meet them to be eligible for our service. What that service is, is then up to the local authority to, to meet. But it's that idea that if you don't meet the gatekeeping eligibility criteria, you will not be able to, to access any statutory potential help or third sector help from that local authority. So what we're trying to do is make sure that the, the keys to access services across the whole Scotland are equal. And then the services that are delivered behind that are bespoke in the local authority depending on need. I think that's how I would view that. Mm, that's clear. Ben? Um, I think that uh, you're right to say that there will still be differences across the different local authorities and probably still within the local authorities, but I think those differences would be reduced. And what the eligibility criteria do do is they add to the transparency of access to services and therefore then the local accountability of people to providing services. And that, for me, then leads on to a democratic process where um, people can challenge their local services or not, as they, as they choose. But without that, people, and we're told this time and time again, people don't know what services are available, how to get to them. 
uh, what the routes are. And this applies to frontline support staff and, and social work staff as well, as well as to carers. And there isn't a clear um, record of what is available to everybody, so it's very much a question of how things fall for you. Suzanne, and then I'm going to bring in Mike and, and Bob Dora. Suzanne, the final one on this. Sorry, I think my colleagues have, have said right, it much more fine. eloquently that, than I could, but I would like to reinforce Claire's point where we, we have um, evidence of you know, carers having to wait significant amount of time for a carer's assessment. And by the time the carer's assessment comes around, the caring situation has ended, either through bereavement or perhaps the person going into longer-term care. So we, we do feel that we need greater clarity and consistency across Scotland in terms of the rights that carers do have and the eligibility criteria. Okay. Mike, mm. and then Bob. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, it occurs to me that obviously, you know, local authorities have got different cost pressures, and um, particularly in these difficult times, there could be a tendency to manipulate or ease their budgetary pressures through raising eligibility criteria. And that seems to me to be profoundly wrong, but I just wondered what the panel members felt about that. Ben, please. Just very briefly, uh, I work um, um, with a network of local authority workers providing what are called short break bureaus and these sort of in-house uh, uh, offices to uh, support accessible breaks and breaks from caring. And we've already just anecdotally heard that there is uh, increased pressure to move from preventative um, forms of breaks into crisis into intervention, and that's, so that's already happening. Scott? Um, I would just briefly draw the committee's attention to the paper written by the Children's Commissioner um, uh, by Dr. Kirsten Stalker called, entitled It All Comes Down to Money. She very much explored the situation of the experience of people who use services versus the experience of a local authority um, and compared and contrast eligibility criteria across the whole of Scotland and people's experience with it. And it, the picture that it did paint was... Uh, local authorities are changing their eligibility criteria because of uh, austerity and budgetary concerns, and, and it doesn't paint a very good picture. Um, but I can provide the information after. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Dennis, you can. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's, it's in a point that both Claire and Fiona uh, really were pursuing, um, and it's with regard to some of the discretionary aspects. And I'm just wondering... We have the duty, and, and, and that's absolutely fine, but when we sort of dilute things down to powers, local authorities can either do or not in some respects, because there's no enforcement aspect when we get to the power. Um, do you think that in that instance, where we've maybe got situations where remote and rural aspects um, are, are there, that the, this, you, you mentioned postcode lottery, I, I'm just not particularly comfortable with that term, but do you think that, that there is a, 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 a problem then in actually taking forward that minimum standard that you've mentioned, Claire, uh, because discretion is discretion, and I'm just wondering sometimes if you don't have the resources, the discretion is you're just not going to provide the service. Yes, Claire? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think there's probably two points there. One is, um, yes, we think it is important that the power is in the bill as well because there needs to be a power to support carers who don't meet eligibility criteria, and it's what we were saying earlier about the importance of preventative support. That's not to say, in a way, that support isn't insecure, and that's why we welcome the bill also providing firm rights for carers because at the moment there is a really excellent network of uh, local care support across Scotland, which is envied by many European countries, and it's really important that that's protected. And we would like to see the bill um, also provide resources towards that preventative support because of the increase in demand there's going to be on it. Um, but as times are tight, um, carer support has always been insecure because there's been no statutory right to support carers um, previously, which is why we're very keen to see this happen. But um, like I say, we also need to um, keep an eye on that preventative support which goes with the power with the bill. Um, the other point you made about rural and remote and how sort of difficult it is in terms of supporting um, people from rural and remote communities and we do have our rural and remote carers working group and we did put in a specific submission from them 
And um, some of the difficulties they have there is, for example, whenever um, the person they look after or um, the carer themselves is provided with an element of support, it's often very difficult for them to take up that support because the services just aren't there. Um, so, for example, we have examples from the Western Isles where people have been given um, a direct payment but haven't been able to purchase a service or employ a personal assistant um, because there's very low unemployment and you have problems with geography as well. Um, so we put forward in our submission a few solutions around some of the challenges in working in rural areas. Um, there's some very good examples of good practice within our, our network. Um, where, for example, uh, local third sector organisations have been either able to employ outreach workers who can extend over a larger areas and provide support to carers, particularly in island communities, or where they've been able to work through, for example, in Argyll and Butte, the local carer centre in Loch Gilphead, um, works through GP practices on some of the islands in order to support carers. They've set up peer support groups and they've employed sessional workers on the islands as well to make sure carers in the very remote areas in Scotland get support. So we believe there are solutions to supporting carers and implementing the duty, but it may, for example, require more resources, particularly when you look at transport costs. Okay. Scott, I think, want to comment on that as well then. I'd just like to support what Claire has said. Um, we've recently travelled all around the whole of Scotland on behalf of the autism strategy, looking at very similar issues in rural areas of Scotland and a very similar picture where um, the more rural you are, the harder it is to even have services put in place. And a lot of people are just getting direct payments and having to uh, leave their jobs as carers to look after the young person because they can't um, employ a personal assistant under option one for self-directed support, which is potentially the only recourse for, for services there. Um, and again, there are very, very inventive and useful models starting to arrive across the whole of Scotland, but um, absolutely second what Claire said. Okay. I think, have you got some questions, Bob, please? Just, I think we're kind of moving slightly away now from eligibility criteria towards a uh, commission and promotion and development of, of services once needs have been identified and there's an attempt to meet them. So just very briefly on eligibility criteria, because there does appear to be a... Maybe it's my confusion, but a conflation of working out what needs should be identified and making sure that's nationally consistent versus local discretion and delivering to meet those needs. And it was Mr Hall, I think, that, that gave me that conflation because we're talking about, let's say someone takes a break from caring or you give a cared for person a break away with the carer or whatever provision is put in place. And you were talking about some local authorities may give X amount of days during the summer, other local authorities may give nothing at all or somewhere in between. For me, that's a conflation between identifying a need that has to be met and the service delivery on the ground. And those are two very different things. And during the whole conversation of eligibility criteria, it became evident to myself that the witnesses were perhaps talking about those two different things under the one term. So um, I'm not sure how we'd get a system where Every young person, every adult carer gets, in some respect, an identical level of service provision because a lot of that is based on the resource allocation each local authority decides to put in to those services. Um, but I do accept the issues around how you identify the type of needs that have to be met. So I'd quite like some opinions on that because I I, there did seem to be a conflation but just a second point to that because I won't come back in for a supplementary convener until I yeah, to move on yeah, yeah. so specifically in relation to the conflation of those two separate things but I also note within the bill there's a duty on local authorities for local eligibility criteria but there's also the power for ministers for national eligibility criteria and within the duty I note that uh, after three years that has to be refreshed, could I suggest that as we develop um, what we do for care, carers and for cared for people in, in Scotland, one of the things we might seek to do is acknowledge that the government has the power in this bill to make it national eligibility criteria if it is required and necessary, and that after three years of operating the local eligibility criteria might might be a way forward on that. Just 
particularly given the tensions I've got between resource allocations that local authorities decide to put in and others that prioritise other needs and that confusion between service delivery and eligibility criteria. I hope that makes sense to me, Convener. I hope it makes yeah. sense. I think to, Fiona's to wanting to yeah. respond to some of that and I'll take <laughs> others. Um, I, I, I take your point around, and, and I think Scott made the point yeah. very well, um, around eligibility criteria primarily, and this is the first part of it, is primarily about gatekeeping and about where is the point that carers know that they will get a resource. Um, and I think we, we, we very much believe that that should be national. Um, I, I take your point about the, the in three years we could have national if local doesn't work. Um, but our view is it would be better trying to develop something that works nationally in the first place and then that, that, rather than waiting three years. Um, I think the, the, the element of, of, of trying to decide um, what carers should be entitled to expect, um, I think we should explore that. Um, and I think as, as the national care organisations, we are, we are exploring that. We're working on the threshold part of it, but also examining what that might look like in practice. Um, it's about really trying to provide a solution rather than saying we don't agree with this, trying to, trying to come up with a solution that we think um, might work. Um, but I think um, primarily the, the eligibility criteria is about thresholds, and I think that we can work together to try and look at what those standards might look like, what carers, when they come to the table, get their adult care support plan, what it might look like and what that might look like across Scotland. Um, at the moment, I know, I know the term postcode lottery is, is I, I'm, I'm, it's, it, it's not a great one, but I think at the moment carers have no rights well, very few rights. They don't have any rights to support. There are some powers to support which have not really been taken up locally. Only six local authorities have taken up the power um, under the Social Care uh, Self-Directed Support Act. Um, and we're looking to find a way to move forward and move forward consistently. And I think that we have an opportunity with the Carers Bill to start with that consistent level rather than working in um, 32 different ways. Ben? Um, I just wanted to come back um, and uh, on the uh, the conflating of the two issues, uh, and I'm sorry if I did conflate them. Um, but the uh, what we're in favour of is a national eligibility framework and national thresholds for services provided, but then with local decisions on uh, the type and the provision of service. And that, when you when you take the bill in the round and you look at care involvement and the and the planning and provision within the care strategies that local authorities would be uh, required to produce, would um, allow for the accountability uh, locally. Clear. Just to reiterate the points colleagues have made, it's almost like there's three stages to this. The first is, what is the threshold? What triggers it? What says a care is eligible to a service? That's stage one, and we absolutely fundamentally believe that should be national. Then the next stage is, what level of support does a carer get? So once you meet eligibility, and you're, you've been told you can get a service, what level of support do you get? There's two ways you could do that. You could make the level of support national or you could make it local. And I think that needs discussion. Certainly, as Fiona said, the national care organisations were looking to put forward a framework for that. But it will be mostly around the threshold and what triggers support for a carer. But the level of support needs looked at. And then the third stage is once you know what support you're getting, what, will that, what form will that support take? And again, um, with the, the choices available to carers through the self-directed support um, choices, um, it may be that they take up a service locally and there will be local variation what services are available and what's offered. Um, but they may also take up a resource and use it um, in a different way for themselves, a more innovative way. So I would say those are the three areas you're looking at with eligibility. The other point you were making about there is within the bill the possibility of moving to national within three years. The point I would make about that is, well, two points really. One is they're going to have 32 local authorities developing local eligibility criteria, and I think it's actually really quite a challenge. I know that certainly one of the submissions the Council said that's going to be very difficult for us to do to set these thresholds. So why have it happening in 32 different areas when we can have a really good national framework um, developed and co-produced by carers, national care organisations, local authorities and health, and get it right the first time around? Secondly, um, for example, with the 2002 Community Care and Health Act, there is the provision for um, government to look at charging policies nationally 
whereas at the moment it's local charging policies. Um, there's been a lot of campaigning around this because of the huge variation and the very unfair charging policies across Scotland, um, and uh, it hasn't happened. So I would say if it goes to within the bill, it being local eligibility criteria, the opportunity to change that to national will be very slim. Anyone else on that? Any members, any other members wanting an in? Nanette. Yes, it's uh, about the information advice service for carers. The, it's section 31 and part, part 6 of the bill. And the, the concerns that local, authority, uh, local authorities could set up sort of fresh services where there already exist with inter care information centres which are trusted by people. They, they already provide a lot of advice. I mean, what, how, how variable is the relationship between local authorities and these independent sectors? Uh, and um, do you think it's, if, if the bill stays as it is, that it's likely that local authorities, some will actually set up their own services instead of using the ones in existence? Heather. Uh, yeah, that's that's really kind of outlined the the concern that we have. I mean, all carers' centres and carers' <coughs> excuse me services do get support in the in terms of funding from the from the local authority that they're situated in. It's part of how the local authorities meet their kind of current criteria in supporting carers. They do it through funding local services. Um, despite the fact that there are assurances in the bill that if services already exist, um, they won't be replaced by a local authority service. We just think that that could be strengthened a bit. It seems at the moment it doesn't respect the very kind of rounded, holistic service that a, care, a bespoke care of service does <coughs> provide. You know, information and advice is just that. And what care of services do is, as well as providing information and advice to all carers, it then follows through with a much more rounded service to the carer that's very focused on what that specific carer needs. It involves signposting to services as well. If, that's, if it's not a service that's provided by the carer centre... They can signpost them or refer them to other services, and we just think that that's a that is a much better service to be provided to a carer rather than something that is in house within the local authority that could again we're well, back to that kind of bare minimum standards that we've been talking about in terms of eligibility. If there is only a, a duty to provide information and advice, there's a risk that that's all the carer would get. And whilst it is quite extensive in terms of what the information and advice would be on. It needs to follow through much more, and the service needs to be there as well. So, I mean, do, do you envisage that, that the local authorities could use this as perhaps a cost-saving exercise? Would they be paying less to themselves, if you like, than they would be to people running a, a more comprehensive service outside? Is that is that one of the concerns? It is a concern, yes. I mean, it's obviously with the with the financial memorandum at its its current form, it's not clear exactly um how the funding would be kind of divided and you know in, in terms of that and we'd need to compare what's in the financial memorandum to the to the funding that's already provided from local authorities to carer services we haven't been able to do that with a great deal of precision at the moment it's something we need to explore later but um the financial memorandum does mm -hmm. say that the costings are based on two information advice workers per local authority. Claire made some interesting points earlier about outreach workers in different areas. Um, you know, two, two local authority information advice workers might be fine in a small, um, sort of averagely populated area, but that wouldn't work for obviously for Highland, for Argyll and Butte, and even for the larger cities where two information advice workers just wouldn't cover the, you know, the need in that area. So, again, we need to see a lot more about what kind of variation would be there to to match the, the needs of the carer population, whether that would be a densely populated area or somewhere that's sparse and very spread out. Suzanne? Um, it's picking up on Ben's earlier point, also about transparency and accountability. And unfortunately, you know, that there is history around the um, Reshaping Care for Older People Change Fund, where 20% of the funds available were to support carers. And as national carer organisations, we found it very difficult to unpick that and to actually say definitively that 20% of those funds have been used to support carers. And um, our concern is that unless you know, that, that money is 
in a sense, ring-fenced. And I know people don't like the term ring-fenced, but it does go to accountability and showing that the money that is earmarked is actually being used for what it is intended for, rather than disappearing into um, a, a black hole, essentially. Clear. Um, whenever we talked about the information and advice duty with carers, they were very clear about what they wanted. They wanted um, an information advice service that was local, that was independent and that was expert. And so following on from what Heather was saying, very much you know the services that are currently provided through local care um, services. And we hope that's something local authorities would choose to continue. Um, I was slightly concerned by COSLA's submission to the Health and Sport Committee where they talked about um, potentially they could um, look at information advice provision through more of a public awareness campaign, which goes against that. Um, we very much hope that the regulations will be very clear and specific around the sort of information and advice provision to carers that's expected. And do you want to come in on that? Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's, uh, on a couple of points there. Yes. Um, uh, the Alliance houses the Dementia Care Voices project, which um, members will probably know Tommy Whitelaw, who, who kind of um, uh, who cared for his mum and, and kind of coordinates that project. And we did a survey of what carers wanted um, what, what, what issues were out there and lots of people came back and said local advice and information it certainly wasn't about um, a, a local awareness campaign it was practical support um, uh, day -to -day on the day to day activities of care and um, information regarding financial and, and legal matters and a lot of that sits within the third sector um, lots of third sector organisations are the first kind of contact for a carer um, and we really welcome within the explanatory notes for this bill the encouragement of local authorities and health boards to make the best use of the third sector. Um, and as acknowledged in that explanatory note, that needs to be adequately and appropriately funded. Um, and again, I'm welcoming the additional funding that's been included in that explanatory memorandum to the third sector. Um, but going back to Heather's point earlier, run clear about how that money is going to be divided up so there's it says that 50 organizations will receive technical support um it support that kind of thing extra capacity around about that but if i would encourage the committee to kind of ask the questions about well who are these 50 organizations you know um scvo did um, a bit of research into what sort of organizations are out there and they found 81 specific carers organizations across the country but that only tells part of the picture there are hundreds of organisations who are providing condition-specific support who also support carers who would really welcome some of this funding too. So how, what is the criteria going to be to decide who gets that additional um, money and, and resource? Mm. Anyone else on that, that, that area? Ben? I just want to emphasise the importance of the information and advice services and we know from research that we did uh, a few people around the table that in terms of short breaks the single biggest barrier to carers not taking a short break was the, the inability to access information and advice so rather than uh, putting at risk existing services we'd, we would want to enhance them. Okay thanks for that. Um, have we got any other members who want to come in at this point? Dennis? Please, Rhoda, do you want back in? Yeah. <laughs> a different question. It's to do with carers' involvement. Um, and there's been a, there's a proposal that we should have a duty um, for uh, both uh, local authority and health boards <coughs> uh, to provide, uh, uh, to take in account of the views of carers and carers' organisations. I just wonder what your opinion is at the moment, because th there is a route at the moment for public bodies to, to be involved. Do you think it's necessary to have the duty for involvement? And if so, how it says practically reasonable, which is something you can't put, I don't think, in legislation in itself, because it means nothing. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, what your views are on the carer's involvement and how we take account of those views. Do you set up a body? And if so, what's the divide between carers and the organisations? Is it a 50-50? Claire, go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's important to use the structures that are there already. So um, without Scotland, throughout Scotland, you do have a lot of um, care forums, for example, which meet locally. Um, and take the views of carers and where the structures work particularly well you will have a carers forum 
um, and a carer within that forum will be represented on local planning, strategic planning committees. Um, so they're bringing the views from uh, the wider care community into that planning structure and then taking the information from the planning structure back to the carer forum. So it means it's more of a two-way process. Um, what I think needs to be acknowledged, though, is that these forums and so on need to be resourced, um, and there hasn't been um, the resource implications of involving carers as partners in care hasn't really been looked at. Um, very often it's through third sector organisations that that support is provided, but these organisations are at full capacity and they're doing it on top of their other um, services, so it's something which very often is the first thing to go, and these structures are not in place in every area in Scotland. Um, and I think it's whenever you look at uh, carers getting involved in some of these, for example, boards um, uh, where um, integration boards, for example, <coughs> it's quite an intimidating thing. It's intimidating for anybody. And um, the way it should work, best practice would be that they receive um, training, they receive induction through the partnership, they receive all the um, resources that are required, whether it's replacement care, transport and so on, but also not just for attending those meetings, but also for attending the forum and providing that link. Um, and in some cases, some areas where there is very good practice, they have mentoring as well for carers who are on these boards. Um, I would like to see that being set as standard. I would like to see the bill providing that through guidance. Um, and I would like to see resources going towards it to make sure that engagement is meaningful. Any other comments? Ben? ben? I, I just want to go back to the principle about why carers should be involved. And we see through the Short Breaks Fund at Shared Care Scotland that time and again, where carers are involved in the planning and in the commissioning of services, they're more effective services. And so the personal outcomes that people get are better. Okay. Rhoda, I think, was wanting to come in, weren't you, Rhoda? And I just wanted to go um, back to something Andrew had said much earlier about emergency plans. Um, I, mean, I suppose my understanding of emergency plans with a plan in place, should something happen, that the carer is maybe takes ill or whatever, that they have that backup. But you touched on something that I thought maybe would have been dealt with under other legislation or should be dealt with under other legislation, where you're looking at the transition for a cured for person, say, someone who's been looked after by a parent, it, it follows that at some point somebody else is going to have to take that caring role. And is it not the case now, or is there something missing now, that those transitions aren't taking place so that kind of the young person leaves home, becomes an independent, um, long before they're actually bereaved of their parent to allow that transition to be over a period of time and not such a shock? Uh, the, the simple answer to that is I don't really know, but the, the sit, we're aware of situations where, you know, I'm talking specifically about older carers um, who are just after that kind of peace of mind about what's going to happen. So I'm not specifically talking about what's in different bits of legislation. I think Fiona will probably have to help me out here. Fiona? Um, I, it, it definitely is the case that the legislation should ensure that carers are involved in um, planning for the transitions of the person that they care for, um, be that for a child to adult services or indeed an adult into older people's services. Um, but what, what we're talking about, what, there is the element of emergency planning, what happens if I fall and break my leg? Um, but as well as future, the, the future planning part of it is what's going to happen as I age. And that should be part of the individual's plan, but in terms of confidence and security that it's, I, I, I know what's going to happen. I'm not frightened of it. I know that if anything happens, there's going to be support for the person that I care for and that there's a plan for them moving forward. There's another part in terms of, I, I, we kind of called it future planning, anticipatory planning. There's a, there's a whole lot of different names for it. Um, but in terms of, of, of carers being able to plan for their own life, to plan for their own aspirations. For example, in the future, I'm a young adult carer. I'm a bit older than that, but I'm a young adult carer. In the future, I would like to be moving into education. I would like to be doing this type of training. I would like to be doing an apprenticeship. And that I can plan for that within my adult care support plan. Or I'm a, I'm a, I'm a carer with a disability. And I know that disability is going to be progressive. 
and so I'm going to need to plan for what the future looks like and a carer should have confidence in being able to do that and I think the current legislation should do part of that but it doesn't really cover carers own lives and it doesn't really provide it, it, it's a way of bringing it into one place as well Thanks. <laughs> no, one, no one else Dennis, uh, Bob, you want you want an, uh, Dennis. Uh, you know, you mentioned something earlier at the briefing about um, young carer statements and the, the, the existing legislation. Maybe we get some of that on the record too, please. And, uh, um, and I'll call you after Bob. Um, Bob, just I, it was actually uh, Rhoda. I was going to ask about uh, emergency uh, planning as well. I, I think uh, in terms of my experience of it would be with adults with learning disabilities in, in Glasgow where many of their parents are, are ageing and the local authorities not always been as sharp as they could be in saying, well, where are we going to be in five years' time, ten years' time, fifteen years' time? So I would probably call it anticipatory planning as opposed to emergency planning, of course. They might end up being one in the same thing if, if there's a kind of crisis, crisis moment. I'm just wondering if there's other legislation that sits just now cause we, uh, where that emergency planning might be taking place but not in discussion with, with the carer. Because uh, we we we, had, we was, was it palliative care we were looking at uh, recently in this committee and we were talking about anticipatory care plans for older people in the residential setting, for example. And I think we're at twenty something percent, and which is pretty low. It's, it's higher than it was, but it's still pretty low. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if there's a bit of connectivity there in terms of other legislation and responsibilities that sit on local authorities or health boards in terms of emergency anticipatory planning. And it also probably, because I'd written down all the things at the start about things that could be in the bill, and the other one I'd written down was in relation to discharge from hospital. Now, if there's identified needs of a social care nature, you'd be hoping for a six-week plan to be put in place when that person leaves hospital. And that would seem to be an obvious hook to say, well, does this, who's caring for this person and does this person already have a carer's assessment? So is there some obvious connectivity that exists that wouldn't actually be that burdensome, it would just be good connectivity to take some of this forward. Scott? I'm not sure I can comment on the connectivity. connectivity. Um, in terms, we have to look at the kind of process that somebody who is a carer with, a say, a, a young adult with a learning disability or a complex care need might have. They would have had an assessment, and that assessment would have said, you would have met X criteria, your criteria entitles you to X, these are the services that are in place, we will then review your services yearly, annually. Those people will age, but the review doesn't necessarily change, and that young person might not have enough support or be able to move on enough. So if we're looking at kind of like care planning, and how you'll, you'll have to look at how care planning for carers or adult care plans fit in within the kind of whole review mechanism of social work and healthcare and the integration of that. And, and in terms of kind of discharge planning, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in linking together models of uh, social support, so supported hours, um, people going into hospital and can you potentially support that person at home rather than go into hospital. I think there's been examples of things such as social prescribing by GPs that have been talked about in that regard and how the care plan then fits together with all of these different kind of planning mechanisms that are already happening. So it's quite a kind of stramash of different approaches and legislation that would have to be drawn together to kind of fit around the carers plan and if I hark back to my kind of earlier comment first comment it's about what I would like to see in the legislation is about how this all dovetails together especially for people with young carers kind of concerns and how that fits in with the child's plan coordinated support plans um, otherwise you're at risk of having loads of plans happening and lots of professionals coming in and out of a young person's life mm -hmm. who's also trying to maintain school who's also trying to care for somebody potentially in their family um, where it could be just one person going in and answering the questions on the care plan that are needed. Fiona. I think in answer to the question that, that there definitely are connections that can be made and, and we'd be very much welcomed um, within the, the policy memorandum around the bill and with their earlier consultation that the um, adult care support plan and support for carers needs to sit um, amongst wider reform and wider policies. And, and that's not just around um, um, a social care 
uh, but it's around health, it's around poverty and inequality, it's around employment. Um, and I think it's very important to try and make those connections, and I think they are there. Um, I think it's just trying to, make, trying to make sure that they actually work. In relation to um, hospital discharge, which, I, which you, you mentioned, um, and I mentioned at the beginning in, in terms of a, of, of a duty, what carers consistently report, um, and we're talking about only a third have been consulted when somebody is discharged, and, and, and that's a very low... So it means two-thirds of people aren't consulted. Or, or, consult, or are consulted at the very last minute. It means that the carers aren't involved in trying to decide what support is there. Um, it, there's an assumption you will provide care. Um, and without putting something in place that says, talk to the carer. Do they want to care? Are they able to care? Because certainly when someone's older, they may not be best well in the world. They may, be, um, they may not be able to care. Um, and, and have those conversations before somebody leaves hospital. Um, and and, and that's, about, that's something about that wider policy. We've got delayed discharge, and, and it's buttoned up against um, ensuring that people are discharged from hospital safely and are discharged in a way that carers can actually provide the support they need without detriment to their own health. So I think... Um, I, we feel that we need some work in relation to that, but I think there's definitely connections with a, with a wide range of policies that are already happening, mm. so we can make it happen there. And I mean, you know, I don't, I, you know the, well, the best world in the world is, you know, it might not be a legislative approach that exactly. actually deals with exactly. that issue because while we look at the needs of the carer, we're also looking at the needs of that person Indeed. who's been cared for. Indeed. Uh, and their overwhelming wish to be out of that clinical setting. It's not maybe that the discussion isn't taking place, but the discussion is a difficult one because you're dealing with the pressure of the person who wants out of a hospital setting, the carers who are struggling to think, how are we going to care for them now because they're at a new low, um, and the options that they face are difficult options Indeed. when you're dealing with a loved one because it may be a residential setting, it may be an intensive packet of care, package of care. You know, so, uh, you know, the, yeah. these discussions, you know, in my experience and wider experience, uh, actually take place. But it doesn't... It, may, <laughs> it, does, it does, There's not an easy solution to them because we're dealing I'm, with very difficult circumstances I'm, that legislation yeah. can't really... I, I would certainly agree we are. In these situations, we are dealing with very difficult situations, but I think the issue primarily is that carers carers report that they're not consulted, um, and and I think it may be that those difficult mm. discussions still need to take place. But it's that point that carers are involved in it, and carers at the moment are saying that they're not. And when it's the 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 care is going to fall on them, they need to be involved to make sure that this happens safely. Mm. Because we're talking about from the from what carers report that 20% of people are being readmitted within one month and that's again about these policies mm -hmm. trying to make them all work together we don't want that, we want these conversations <laughs> to happen well but our point is that carers must be involved in them, I think that's in terms of In terms of the adult care plan then is there, is there a specific area of, um, uh, that should be in that about because a lot of this is support for the carers and the family, mm -hmm. that, that the role of the family should it because sometimes, you know, it becomes over. You can be squeezed out of the, sit the situation in, in many cases. You know, that there isn't a specific... Is there a specific role in that adult care plan that says, as a family, this is what we want to do, what we need to do, and all the other bits fitting in with that in support of that family? It's difficult to go mm. along and, and, and play a role in a family if you don't want to be there when the carers are there at that particular time in the morning, you exclude yourself. Or at that time in the evening, you exclude yourself. Or, you know, <coughs> you know I'm, just, I'm just wondering if there is a discussion that should take place about the role that the family want to play in support of that person, rather than looking at simply, this is what the state can provide. <coughs> is that the wrong way around, or is it... Or am I getting it wrong? Claire's going to put me right, I think. 
Um, I think you're right. That is what, what needs to happen. And when you look, for example, at hospital discharge, um, families very often do want to help provide care when somebody's coming out of hospital, but there may be restrictions around the amount of care and the type of care they can provide. And I think the bill makes a good point. It um, sort of doesn't talk any, any more about the carer's ability to care, which is in previous legislation, but they're, whether they're able and willing to care. And those are two important points. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you don't speak to carers, for example, at time of um, hospital discharge, then you won't know, um, do they have, are they in employment? Do they have other dependents? Um, do they have health um, conditions themselves, which would restrict the sort of care that they're able to provide? Which is why we think there needs to be a duty, because it needs to be done in partnership. And you were talking about some of the pressures whenever somebody is in hospital. There's pressures from the person wanting to leave hospital. That's really common. But one thing you didn't mention was there's actually a lot of pressure on staff as well to discharge people because of the figures they're trying to meet. There was recent research done um, looking at the attitude of nurses at, at the time of um, hospital discharge and it found that 72% um, of nurses in Scotland feel families need to take more responsibility for their older relatives and 78% said they don't think families um, should be blamed if there's not enough support in place but that means that you know um, so almost one in four say that care and um, families should be blamed if there isn't enough support in place there is in some areas a culture from um, health professionals which says that people should be discharged as soon as possible and it's the family's responsibility to take that care on. And There needs to be more um, involvement of carers in what care they're willing and able to provide and um, what they're able to contribute then needs to be part of the care package but there shouldn't be any assumptions made around that. I think it's really key and where it falls down where that conversation doesn't happen is exactly when you go home and there's a crisis situation, mm -hmm. the carer can't cope um, not enough supports in place and the person ends up back in hospital. Yeah, and there's not enough sometimes discussion within the family. A carer can exclude other members of the family almost by their commitment or overwhelming commitment. That they, 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 you know, there's not sometimes a discussion in families about everybody being able to contribute yeah. to the care of that individual. Anyway, they're complex and it's emotional nice. stuff. Uh, Heather. Please. And then I've got Scott, and we're into the last six minutes. <laughs> that's not a lot of pressure then, that's all right. Uh, Claire did actually make most of the points that I wanted to say, but the, the example that you've just given there, Convener brought it up again, the, the reason for a desire for a legislative requirement for emergency planning is to make sure that those conversations are then had. You know, the future, future planning mm. doesn't need to be the, the far distant future. It can be the immediate future following a hospital discharge. A carer might be able to provide short-term high-intensity care if someone has been discharged from hospital but they might need to have a wider conversation with other family members or need to bring in um, other maybe a care agency or something and that's that can be discussed in emergency and future planning as part of a carer support plan but if a carer doesn't realize that that option is available to them to have that wider discussion with professionals and with other family members then they might not have it so that's another reason to to kind of bring that in and make sure it's a requirement for, for everyone to have those discussions. Scott? Um, it's pretty much been covered. I'm just wondering if there is a duty within the legislation for people to refer to you a carer's support plan on discharge of family member kind of clause. Which would then circumnavigate people feeling excluded potentially. Mm -hmm. Is there any other comments on that? issue or I don't see any other bids from committee members at this point. Say, yes, oh, Dennis, I was prompting you about that children's one. Yeah, Please I'll come back to that in a second, but uh, just on this part, I, I think, you know, Fiona's mentioned it, Helen's mentioned it, Claire's mentioned it, Scott, uh, I think conversations do take place, they're just not recorded in some respects uh, or, or sometimes and there's a perception there uh, and looking at the, the complexity of discharge, uh, quite often, you know, we haven't spoken about it, but the power of attorney we, we do have quite often a name person that, that is taking the lead in terms of the family. You know, and I, and I know you mentioned, you know, that, you know, sometimes families disagree with one another as to whether or not a person does require what level of care. But if someone has power of attorney, they have that legislative requirement then or, or ability to, to actually make that decision on behalf of uh, maybe the rest of the family because they've been given that uh, power. You... You uh, 
invited me earlier to, to mention about children. It was really, in Scott, you, you mentioned about all the dovetailing within the le legislative frameworks. Um, w with regard to the, the, <coughs> the assessment in terms of or the statement for a young person, the thing that struck me was that the, there's a, we have already GERFEC. We're taking forward the name person. Um, for me, you know, the, there's already layers, and I'm just wondering if the layers that we have currently are sufficient without going down another route, or do we need this other one to ensure that no one falls through the net? Um, my concern is about too much planning and not enough action for people. Sometimes we can yeah. have a lot of bureaucracy and nothing really happens. Mm -hmm. um, and within the GERFEC and the Shinari indicators, you've got things like sa safe and healthy, achieving, respected, involved. Some of these indicators will obviously be well-being risks in terms of being a young carer if you're not attending school there'll be a well-being risk that will be activated under getting it right for every child the named person should then consider this well-being risk so there is that but the the worry is that shinari is looking at well-being in a whole and does it really really focus on the needs of a young carer specifically and do we need a more specific focus on that area of a young person's life or the ability if that is their only well-being risk to really kind of look at the support that that young person needs as a young carer rather than a well-being risk. I don't know. I've put that open to other people. Okay. Heather, <laughs> Heather, 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 what you want to... Uh, yeah, yeah, just to, to answer uh, both Dennis and Scott's questions directly, I think, yes, we do need a specific young carer statement um, for two reasons. The first is that for a lot of young carers, that is their only well-being need and therefore something that's specifically for young carers and designed to look at how to support them specifically as young carers it, it's it's really really important to have something that's that's just about that and for them and secondly uh, in consultation with young carers there is quite a lot of opposition to having a child's plan again if that is the only well-being need if that is the only vulnerability of the young carer a child's plan will not be suitable for them uh, i think again the I agree with, with colleagues and other members of the committee that there's quite a lot of differing pieces of policy and legislation that are going to be affecting young carers and it's not quite clear how that's all going to work in practice but again the importance is making sure that people don't fall through the net, that the support is there and provided that the, the young person's wishes are respected and that confidentiality is respected, information sharing needs to needs to happen in as joined up a way as possible. It seems like the best way to do that would be for something specific for young carers. Okay. Uh, no other questions from committee members at this point. It's left for me then to thank you all for your time here this morning, for your written evidence that we've, you, you've already provided. Um, the committee appreciates that very much and we look forward to working with you through this um, scrutiny of of this bill. Um, thank you very much for your attendance and your participation this morning. Thank you again. Bye bye. Safe journey home. That concludes the business of the committee today. Thank you very much.